Let's pray. O God of love and grace, God of artistry and creativity, we come to you today and we are longing, as always, to hear you speak a a fresh word into our lives, And so we pray today that the words of our mouths, the meditations of our hearts, the stroke of my paintbrush (laughs) would all be pleasing to you. And where, if anywhere, we depart from your spirit, O God, let that quickly fall away. Amen. All right. Well, friends, have you ever had an experience that just made your power, your energy, your zest for life feel like it was being drained out of you? Like the life was being sucked out of you? Ever had an experience like that? Grief can do it, right? Depression can certainly do it. Persistent abuse and trauma, that can do it. Chronic illness or even caring for someone with a chronic illness, that can do it. Well, today we meet a woman who has been bleeding for 12 years. She's been hemorrhaging for 12 years. You know, I hemorrhaged after giving birth to my daughter. (laughs) I know what that feels like. It feels in a lot of ways like what Jesus is going to describe later in the story, like you feel this power going out of you. 
kind of feels like you are just left weak. I was so weak after I hemorrhaged that the doctors and the nurses, they wouldn't let me stand up for 24 hours. I couldn't even stand up to pick up my newborn when she was crying out for me. It was torture. Do any of you know anyone with a bleeding disorder? The people I've known who've had bleeding disorders, they have to go get iron infusions, blood transfusions, just to feel like they're halfway normal. <laughs> I can't imagine bleeding for 12 years in a world without all those modern day interventions. I can't imagine the despair that would set in when nothing worked, nothing helped, nothing healed, nothing stopped that draining flow. This week I learned about a woman named Jennifer Bray. I watched her TED talk and her documentary called Unrest. She was this bright, young, energetic, globe-trotting 28-year-old who was working on her PhD at Harvard when she came down with what she thought was just a typical bug. She got a fever. It rose to 104.7. And from that day on, life would never be the same for her. She recovered from her illness, but she started to find that even the slightest exertion was terribly exhausting. She had to hug the walls 
when she was going to the bathroom. She'd have to stop and rest every few stairs on her way up to her apartment. She says in her TED talk that she tried to rationalize her symptoms. She thought maybe this is just what aging feels like. Maybe this is what the other side of 25 feels like. <laughs> and then the neurological symptoms started. She couldn't draw sometimes the right side of a circle, for instance. In the next year, she got 12 infections. Doctors ran all sorts of tests, and they kept telling her she was fine. They told her that this was just the product of stress or dehydration. Finally, her neurologist gave her the diagnosis of conversion disorder, which is basically that all of these physical symptoms were being caused by some latent repressed trauma in her past. On her way home from that neurologist's office that day, she collapsed, and she would spend the next two years bedridden. Sometimes something as simple as getting up from the bed and flipping on the light switch would take all of her energy. If she walked a block, she'd be bedridden for a week. Light and sounds, even really minor sounds like the rustling of sheets, they started to cause excruciating pain for her. But Jennifer was more persistent and determined than most of us. She kept reaching out for answers. She kept reaching out for a diagnosis, for help, for healing. Until finally, she was diagnosed with myalgic encephalomyelitis. I actually said it right. <laughs> Otherwise known as chronic fatigue syndrome. And it's not a particularly rare disease. It's estimated that about 15 to 30 million people around the globe suffer from this. But little is known about it, about its cause or its treatments. It hasn't largely been studied, mostly because it is very often written off as hysteria, misdiagnosed as psychological, when it's actually biological.
Jennifer Bray, that woman I was telling you about, she describes those first few years with MECFS. She says, it was like I died, but was forced to watch as the world moved on. She said, she thought, if I completely disappear and I'm in this bed and can do nothing, then it's like I didn't exist, don't exist. And then what's the point of being born? And she says, some days, I just feel like I'm doing a good job to be holding it together and not killing myself. Have you ever had shadows creep into your life that were so heavy and so dark that you were felt like you were being buried alive? The hemorrhaging woman in our story today, she isn't just sick and weak. She is also cut off from her world by her condition. And I can imagine she probably relates a bit to that Jennifer Bray and what she experienced in her first few years. That feeling of being forced to watch as the world moves on, feeling like you've died. Because you see, in ancient Hebrew culture, a woman was considered ritually unclean when she was bleeding. She wasn't allowed into the temple during those times. And if someone touched her, they too would become ritually unclean. 
So when you were bleeding, you were supposed to separate yourself, distance yourself from the community. Which is one thing if it's a few days of a month. It's a whole other thing when it is 12 years nonstop. So even if she wasn't bedridden, she was removed from community. Twelve years without touch. When I was a kid, I managed to get poison oak all over my body. No one touched me or gave me a hug for a full week. And at the end of it, I was broken. I remember going into my parents' room desperate for touch and connection and sobbing and begging please give me a hug. <laughs> if that's what a week did to me, imagine 12 years. 12 years without touch, or like Jennifer Bray and so many with ME, CFS, having the touch of your loved ones become excruciatingly painful to the point that you can no longer tolerate it. What would it be like to be in the shoes of the woman in our story today and know 
that if you did get that touch that you so desperately craved, the person who gave it to you, they had to choose between closeness to you and access to God there at the temple. What would it be like to know that if you took that touch without consent from someone, you were cutting them off, at least temporarily, from their access to religious life there at the temple? Buried alive, we all feel it at times. The psalmist often describes it as that feeling of being down in a pit. <laughs> of having this deep, heavy shadow close in on you, cut you off from God or community or both. The woman in our story does something gutsy. She does something really ballsy. <laughs> 
she reaches out and she takes the healing that she needs. She just takes it. She's heard about Jesus' healing powers and she dares to reach out and touch him. Even though she's ritually unclean, even though this will make him ritually unclean. It's an act of desperation as much as faith. It's this last ditch leap of hope that maybe, just maybe, this can heal her when nothing else has. And when she reaches out and she touches him, they both feel it. The power flows out of him and into her. And you know what? Perhaps we expect him to rebuke her for taking without asking, but he doesn't. Instead, he praises her for her faith and for her hope that maybe life again is possible. I wonder how many of us are gutsy enough to reach out and take the healing that we need. Reach out and take our healing from God. I wonder how many of us reach out for and cling to that resurrection hope that when all is lost, somehow, some way, by the power of God, life again is possible.
I want to be careful here that I don't get misinterpreted. <laughs> to be clear, I'm not saying you can pray away every illness or every mental illness, every grief or trauma. I firmly believe that God can and does work through doctors and therapists and medicine. And I also firmly believe that illnesses and injuries and conditions are not the result of soul sickness or sinfulness. Good, faithful people get sick all the time. I'm also not promising that Jesus' healing and resurrection power is some magic pill. For Jennifer Bray, hope of life again, faith that her mourning might be turned into dancing, it's looked like raising awareness about her illness with this dogged persistence, using all the energy that she has to try to make a difference, pushing for more research to be done, so that someday there might be a more effective treatment to help people who are suffering like she is. Tapping into hope and the healing power of God, it doesn't always mean an end to suffering, but it does mean strength for the journey. It does mean that you find yourself tethered, not alone. It does mean that you discover that you don't have to do everything on your own power. That when you are weak, there is someone to share their power with you. And there's incredible power in that. When we are in the beloved community of Christ, we embody that to each other. Sometimes in our weakness, we have to lean on others in the body of Christ. And other times we have to share our own strength. We have to let it flow out of us and on to another. Have to help carry someone else's burdens. Because we are called, friends. We are called to be Christ to each other. To make Christ real to each other. To bring to one another that hope that life again is possible. Thanks be to God for those moments when our morning turns into dancing, when we are lifted up from the depths and brought back from the realm of the dead and healed because of the power of God and because of the Christ-like way that we show up for one another. Thanks be to God. Amen.